Good morning, and welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power. Uh, page 505, if you're following along, page 505, the first full paragraph on the page. It says, To Edward the Sixth, therefore, justly belongs the honor of having been the first Protestant king of England. And all true history assigns to him such honesty in the administration of affairs and such purity of personal motive that although he died at the early age of 16 and reigned but seven years, he was enabled by his consistent policy to leave an illustrious record of his virtues. And it must ever be spoken to his praise that youthful as he was, he succeeded in holding in check the bad passions which had held their carnival during the reign of his father, Henry VIII, and putting his foot firmly upon the monster of persecution, the rack and the thumbscrew, infernal instruments of the papal inquisition, were cast aside, and papists were allowed to maintain their religious faith without fear of torture or the scaffold. Although re religious differences may have led to the conviction and execution of his maternal uncle, the Duke of Somerset, Yet the young king was constrained to consent to his death because, upon the record of his trial, he appeared guilty of the design to seize upon his own person and the administration of the government, and for these purposes to raise an insurrection in the city of London. When he placed his signature to the death warrant of the Anabaptist Joan Boker, who was convicted of heresy, he did so with tears in his eyes, yielding rather to the persuasions of Cranmer, who had been trained in the school of Henry VIII, than to his own convictions. And it may be fairly inferred that his assent to the subsequent execution of Van Parr for heresy was obtained by the same influence. But of these executions, the papists did not complain on their own account, saying merely that, quote, the reformers were only against burning when they were in fear of it themselves, unquote, and availing themselves of them to stir up disaffection and insurrection against the government. If they remain as blots upon his reign, they still leave it white as snow compared to that of his Roman Catholic father, and only go to prove that in times so stamped as those were, with the intolerance of Rome, the principles of Protestantism were necessarily the, of slow growth, that they had to contend against such combinations as, without providential protection, they could not have resisted, and that when in the end they did supplant the antagonistic principles of Romanism, they removed the most crushing weight of tyranny which has ever rested upon mankind since the beginning of the Christian era. King Edward, Edward VI was supposed to entertain some fears that his sister Mary, the daughter of Henry VIII, by Catherine of Aragon, an heir to the throne, would, after his death, lend her influence to the papists on account of her mother's influence upon her education. The Duke of Northumberland, taking advantage of this, and probably being, of, uh, probably being the first to suggest it, induced him to set aside the succession of Mary and Elizabeth, also a daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Bolin, by the formal assignment of the crown to Jane Grey, daughter of the Duke of Suffolk, who by the will of Henry VIII was made next in succession after Elizabeth. This act was manifestly without authority of law, and while it resulted from the ambitious desire of the, the Duke of Northumberland to get the control of the government during the minority of Jane Grey, who was his daughter-in-law, the motive on the part of Edward was to save the Protestant Reformation from overthrow. 
The result, however, was not what either anticipated. Lady Jane Grey was one of the most accomplished women in England at the early age of 16. She was wholly without ambition and devoted exclusively to her studies and domestic pursuits. At first, she declined the crown with befitting modesty, but finally yielded to the entreaties of the Duke of Northumberland and suffered herself to be proclaimed queen. This was not considered a triumph by the Protestants, who had no confidence in the Duke, he being, as they supposed, influenced entirely by his personal ambition and ready to rejoin the Papists if he could thereby promote his temporal interests. And besides, he was unpopular with the people on account of his agency in procuring the death of the Duke of Somerset, who was greatly esteemed. And besides also, there existed a general impression that the assignment of the crown by Edward was illegally made. The papists, of course, took advantage of all of this and zealously pressed the claims of Mary on account of her, her known devotion to the Pope and her support, quote, of the most extravagant things in the, Romans, in the Romish church, unquote. Mary was proclaimed Queen of Norwich. Uh, was, uh, excuse me. Mary was proclaimed Queen at Norwich, and was furnished with troops by the countries of Norfolk and Suffolk to maintain her right. Many, if not a large majority, of these were reformers, who, before they espoused her cause, obtained. Uh, before they espoused her cause, to defend her, that is, obtained from her a solemn promise that, while she would reserve to herself the liberty of professing her own religion, which was Roman Catholicism, she would leave the religion of the kingdom as she found it, as she found it under King Edward VI, in other words, Protestantism, that is, as it was at the close of the reign of Edward VI, Whatever may have been her secretly cherished design, they know but little of history and to the teachings of the papacy who do not know that it has always regarded such promises as carrying with them no obligation of obedience, but as absolutely void. Now this needs to be emphasized, that when a papist takes any oath, that runs detrimental in any way to the papacy, his temporal and spiritual power, or the, or the best interests of the Roman Catholic Church, they are null and void. You've heard people, maybe some of you have heard, have heard in the past, no negotiations with papists. This is why. Because whatever agreements they make that may be advantageous to them for, the t for a time, if a time ever comes when they can repudiate and go against their oath, they will do so. So uh, uh, the word of a papist cannot be trusted. And we should avoid making any covenants at all with, with those who throughout history have demonstrated a religious conviction to defy their own oaths when it, is, when it is in the best interest of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, and I will just add, too, that this is embodied in Roman Catholic canon law. It's the law of the Church. As a matter of fact, the Roman Catholic Church does not call these oaths. If someone says an oath that runs counter to the interests of the Roman Catholic Church, from the Roman Catholic Church's point of view, from the papacy's point of view, it's not an oath, it's a perjury. It should never have been made in the first place. But the papacy is cheap in that it will avail itself of advantages of, of these oaths being spoken and, and to use it against... Uh, use it for their benefit as long as they can, and then renege on the oath when the opportunity presents itself. 
Okay, it's a it's a lose lose situation. What I'm trying to say, a lose lose situation to make any agreement with the papacy. Now I want to give you one huge example. The author just gave us one. I'm going to give you another one. Vatican Council II and ecumenism. The peace, the phony peace that was thrown before the evangelical churches in this country to bring them back into the Roman Catholic Church. That is going to work solely for the benefit of the Roman Catholic Church and solely for the destruction of the churches that once called themselves Protestant. The Roman Catholic Church is never going to be bound by any... uh, 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 demand for rights for Protestants and any agreement that the churches of this country make with the Roman Catholic Church under the tenets of Vatican Council II are designed to destroy those churches Vatican Council II was a hoax it was a very subtle sinful diabolical way of destroying the Protestant Reformation in this country. It's one of the most masterful, cra- masterfully crafted Trojan horses that Rome has ever produced in the Counter-Reformation to destroy Protestantism in this country. The most successful at destroying God's church in this country. Now... Continuing, the author writes, Innumerable instances are recorded where popes have violated their most solemn promises upon the flimsiest pretexts and authorized others to do so, alleging, by way of apology, that the interests of the church demanded it and that no covenant injurious to that interest were binding. We have seen this in the cases of the kings who swore to obey Magna Carta. The Council of Constance regarded the promise of quote-unquote safe conduct given by the emperor to John Hus, although the pope, by the strongest implication, knew of and assented to it. The Third Lateran Council, in one of the canons enacted by it, declared that quote, They are not to be called oaths, but rather perjuries, which are in opposition to the welfare of the church and the enactments of the Holy Fathers, unquote. So, if they take any oath that is injurious to the Roman Catholic Church, they are not considered oaths by the papacy, but perjuries. They're null and void. Now, that Queen Mary yielded her royal assent to this doctrine is beyond all question. Whether she did it of her own volition or in obedience to the universal sentiments of the partisans of the papacy is of no consequence. It is the fact alone that is important. Her first step in that direction was a proclamation qualifying her promise by declaring that she should use no force to compel the adoption of the Roman religion, quote, till all was regulated by the authority of Parliament, unquote, thus indicating the purpose of shielding herself behind that body. This proclamation excited the apprehensions of the people to whom she had made promises, and they immediately sent to her a petition praying her to remember a promise which she had made them with her own mouth, unquote. The manner in which this petition was received shows not only the perfidious character of this queen, but how completely she was controlled by the unprincipled hierarchy of Rome and the low state of morals which prevailed among them. It was haughtily rejected as offensive to royalty, because it reproached the queen with failure of her word. The petitioners were told that, quote, subjects were not to control the actions of their sovereigns, 
unquote. And Dolby, one, one of the number who had borne the petition, was set in the pillory. In other words, <laughs> she locked up the messenger. And it says the mask was then unblushingly thrown aside. And from that time, the reign of this false queen was distinguished by some of the most bloody and cruel acts of persecution of which English history gives any account. She did not even spare the innocent Jane Grey, whose head fell beneath the axe of her executioner for what others had done in her name. A Protestant judge was fined a thousand pounds sterling for ordering the justices of Kent to conform themselves to the laws of Edward, not yet repealed. The prisons were filled with the victims of papal vengeance, and it was soon made apparent that they were to be forced to disavow their Protestantism. Thus were taken, without delay, to provide for the abrogation of, quote, all laws which had been made in favor of the Reformation and to restore the ancient religion, unquote. That is Roman Catholicism. This is real history, folks. And history is repeating itself in this very same fashion right here in the United States of America. Rome has gained the upper hand in our government. And the evidence of that is the Patriot Act and all of the legislative acts that have taken place since then. They're imposing Roman Catholic canon law in this country in direct contradistinction to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, that Protestant document that guarantees us liberty and certain inalienable rights. Those have been usurped by the Patriot Act in the false guise of national security. Rome never changes. And it is important that my listeners learn to see the papal hand in what takes place in this country from now on. Now, he says, With a view to this, it was resolved to prohibit a free election of commons. Okay? No more free elections. Now, remember, commons was that, se that section of the parliament that represented the people. That's why it was called the commons, the house of commons. It says, with a view to this, that is, restoring the ancient religion of Roman Catholicism in England, the first thing that had to go was the house of commons. You have to put down the voice of the people. It says, with this, in with in, with a view to this, it was, it was resolved to prohibit a free election of the commons in order to prevent the return of a majority of reformers and thus to avoid any parliamentary action which should reflect the will of the people. Rome always first silences the people. And it says, the whole power of the queen was employed for this purpose, and says Rapin, the historian, quote, all sorts of artifices, frauds, and even violence were put in practice to carry the election in favor of the court, unquote. Now, you must know the court represented the queen, and the queen represented the pope. And it says, Protestant magistrates, Protestant judges, were removed. Let me, let me just stop and tell you. I think for the very first time in the history of this country, there is not one single Protestant on the Supreme Court. Six Roman Catholics and three Jews. Not one single Protestant on the court. And that court interprets our Constitution. The job of the, of the Supreme Court is to interpret the Constitution. And you can look for that court when it is an advantage to the Roman Catholic Church to begin altering its interpretation, its historic interpretation of that document, to uh, assist in implementing Roman Catholic canon law 
in replacement of that Constitution. Pro again, Protestant magistrates, that's Protestant judges, were removed and Romanists put in their place. The people were intimidated, quote, by menaces, by actions, by imprisonments in the most frivolous pretenses, unquote. So threats, uh, real and imagined, are going to be used to benefit this. And I can just give you one personal experience that I had even last night. The intimidation that is now being put upon certain individuals on amateur radio for their exercise of their First Amendment rights is unprecedented in the history of amateur radio. And it is being sponsored by the Federal Communications Commission and by the Amateur Radio Relay League, that so-called uh, benevolent pseudo-governmental agency that represents amateurs in, in uh, the world of, of radio, is allowing it to happen. Open persecution of those who speak out against the government or speak out against the papacy. Now, Protestants were not allowed in some places to participate in the election assemblies. False returns were made without scruple, and thus a majority of the commons favorable to the queen and the pope was obtained. In other words, they got control of Congress. Okay? They called it Parliament there, but it, the equivalent is Congress. The papacy got control of Congress and silenced the people. Do you feel like that's happening in this country? Might you believe that there's at least a reasonable chance that the papacy is just as involved here in the United States as it was during this time in England? I'm asserting that that is true unequivocally. And it says, it did not, of course, take a parliament thus elected long to repeal all the laws of Edward and to realize the persecutions against the Protestants. This accomplished, the queen, through the intrigues of Charles V, was afterward married to Philip of Spain, his son, in order to put the throne of England in a more complete state of dependence upon the Pope and to introduce the system of persecution so long practiced by the Spanish Inquisition and with which the English people had not yet become familiar. That's right, they didn't want the Queen to marry an Englishman. They wanted her to remain a papist, and so they had her marry the son of the King of Spain, Roman Catholic Spain. And it says, the sequel proved that the real object was not to convert the Protestants, but to overwhelm and extirpate them. No mercy for Protestants. They don't care to, to evangelize and convert a Protestant to Roman Catholicism. No, under the dictates of the Fourth Lateran Council, it is to persecute, to execute, to exterminate, and to wipe them out. And history proves the Roman Catholic Church is loyal to the popes and to the Fourth Lateran Council, and they don't want reform of reformers. They want them dead. And we'll talk about it more when we get back to the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. 
If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Okay, welcome back to the from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. If you love Inquisition Update, if you love the truth, please support First Amendment Radio. Now, this marriage, this contrived marriage between Mary and Philip of Spain was a marriage of opportunity. It not only made sure that Mary remained steadfast to loyalty to her, to the Pope, but to marry a heretic Protestant nation to the Spanish Inquisition. Protestant England had never yet felt the sting of the Holy Roman Inquisition. Persecution aplenty, but never on the order of the Spanish Inquisition. The papacy was going to bring that bloody counter-reformation, Council of Trent-inspired Spanish Inquisition to Protestant England. And they did it through the marriage of, uh, of uh, Mary and, uh, and Philip. And I, I said the Council of uh, uh, Trent, but we're talking about uh, the Fourth Lateran Council. The, 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 the uh, Fourth Lateran Council made religious persecution and the extirpation of heretics not only lawful, but an obligation. Every Roman Catholic then was obliged by that law to extirpate heretics. And out of that rose the Spanish Inquisition, the Fourth Lateran Council. And history records the bloody ruthlessness of this Inquisition against anyone suspected of heresy in Spain, the most Catholic country in the history of the world. And they're going to bring this bloody machine to England. They're going to mop up the Protestants. Anything left over from the reign of Edward VI is going to be extirpated and annihilated. Talking about this marriage of Mary and Philip of Spain, the marriage of Protestant England to the Spanish Inquisition, he, the author says, the sequel proved that the real object was not to convert Protestants, but to overwhelm and extirpate them. Okay? Rome is not interested in converting a heretic. 
they give you two warnings. The third one, they lop off your head. That's And they do it in the name of God. When they kill a heretic, they think they do God's service. Does that remind you of any scripture? The Bible goes out of its way to identify this papal system as the biblical Antichrist. It is amazing to me that it is so uh, a, such a secret in the United States today who the biblical Antichrist is. And it says, the whole reign of Mary, now this is the one they call Bloody Mary, the whole reign of Mary was consequently one of blood. In the last year before her death, 39 Protestants suffered martyrdom, and four of these about a week before she died. It is difficult to arrive at a true estimate of the number of her Protestant victims, it being variously stated at from two to eight hundred. That the object of Philip in becoming the husband of Mary was to obtain control of the English government so as to subject the people to the complete dominion of the papacy, there's no earthly doubt. His ruling passion was ambition, and there was no surer method of gratifying it than to become master of England. Quote, he inherited his father's vices, fraud, and ambition, and united to them more dangerous vices of his own, sullen pride and barbarity. England seemed already a province of Spain, groaning under the load of despotism and subjected to all the horrors of the Inquisition. The people were everywhere ripe for rebellion and wanted only to be able to uh, uh, only and wanted only an able leader to have subverted the queen's authority. No such leader appeared. Unquote. And why did no such leader appear? All candid historians give the answer. The nobility had become so corrupted that they cared for nothing but to retain their power, which they were ready to do by conforming to the royal will, no matter at what sacrifice of character or conscience. In other words, they were willing to betray the gospel of Jesus Christ to maintain their power. If there was any Protestantism in the, in the nobility, they simply caved and it says, the few of them that dared to maintain their independence or to defend the right of the people to adopt their own form of religious belief paid for it with their lives or escaped miraculously. The bishops who had favored the Protestant Reformation were removed. The Roman bishops put in their places. And these last, in a short time, true to the papal policy, became, quote, a power behind the throne greater than the throne itself, unquote. Here it is, the shadow government standing behind the throne, covering itself behind the throne. The shadow government, the papists that were behind the throne of England. The shadow government is the same today as it was then. Nancy Pelosi is a papist. A good portion of Barack Obama's cabinet are Roman Catholics. And they stand behind politics, never accounting for their actions in government to the papacy, but they are loyal to the papacy. It says there were fit tools of the papacy, fully prepared and ready not only to dictate to Philip and Mary the bloody work which Rome required to be done, but to do it with untiring alacrity. A few years before, during the reign of Henry VIII, the Pope, Paul III, had entered into an alliance with the Emperor Charles V, the father of Philip, for the extermination of heresy in Germany. Or in other words, says Russell, quote, for oppressing the liberties of Germany under pretense of maintaining the jurisdiction of the Holy See, unquote. This league, one of the most infamous and accursed in all history, 
was understood by both the contracting parties to involve the necessary uh, the necessity of applying force to put down the hitherto unresisting Protestants, to totally destroy them. That the Pope so understood it is shown by the fact that it bound him to further the Emperor with 12,000 foot, 500 horse, and 200,000 crowns for carrying on the war. He also gave the emperor one year's revenue for the, uh, of the benefices of Spain with power to alienate a hundred thousand crowns worth of church lands to defray his expenses. You think Rome won't go to the expense of killing God's people? For nearly two thousand years, Rome has killed God's people and claimed that she was doing God's service. Trained in such a school as this, and with such examples of his ambition, no wonder that Philip felt himself charged with the obligation to inaugurate a reign of terror in England, one transcending all the outrages and and enormities of Henry VIII. Under the pressure, therefore, of such a system, far the larger part of those who were concerned in the management of government and England and the Church of England sunk into ignominious subjection to the joint power of the crown and the papacy. And the people, without some master spirit to guide them, were compelled to submit to the same degradation. Those from whom they had a right to expect encouragement and protection either suffered death at the hands of the public executioner or were engaged in contriving plans for their greater humiliation. These latter, both peers and bishops, labored, quote, how to qualify and mold the sufferances and subjection of the people to the length of that foot that is to tread on their necks. How repine may, re- may serve itself with the fair and honorable pretense of public good. How the puny law may be brought under the wardship and control of lust and will, unquote. And their efforts were successful, according to the most sanguine an- an- anticipations of the Pope, of Charles V and Philip, and of all those who were thirsting for Protestant blood and were ready to engage in exterminating its possessors. Cardinal Pole, who had been driven out of England and had received the protection of Charles V, and who was thoroughly devoted to the papacy, was recalled and placed in such relations to Queen Mary that he was allowed to mold her policy in reference to both temporal and ecclesiastical affairs. He was governed by instructions from Rome, which of course required him to reduce England to the low condition of becoming again a papal province. In an oration delivered before Philip and Mary and the whole Parliament, this cardinal, as legate of the Pope, spoke of the great love of the Pope for England on account of its having been the first island converted to Christianity, reminded them that this affection was so strong in the mind of Pope Adrian IV that he gave to King Henry II, quote, the right to, senior, uh, to sovereignty, of the dominion of Ireland, which pertained to the Holy See, unquote, referred to his conference with the Emperor Charles V, who he said, quote, hath travailed most in the cause of religion, unquote, and avowed the purpose of his mission to be the bringing of England into unity with Rome. Does this sound familiar with Vatican Council II, to bring you into unity with Rome? Is unity with Rome what we really need in light of this English history? This, said he, required that all should adhere to the Pope as the vicar of God, who derives his power not from man or the consent of governments, but from above and whose power is both imperial and ecclesiastical. And he told them that in order to bring the nation into subjection to the Pope, 
they must revoke and repeal those laws and statutes which be imp- impediments, blocks, and bars to the execution of his commission. Unquote. There goes the Constitution of the United States. Because it is an impediment, it blocks and it bars the reign of the Pope in this country. That Constitution is being systematically torn down, just as were the laws that came to England by the hand of Protestant uh, 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 the Protestant king, Edward VI of England. History is repeating itself, and God's people have no idea that the papacy's hand is behind it, and even if it is, what significance that has for them. We've lost our Protestant history. We don't even know what it is to be a protestant anymore in this country. What voices do you hear rising above the din of controversy and lies coming out of the mainstream and alternative medias? What voices do you hear coming out of the churches today declaiming the papacy as the biblical antichrist? Name them. If this, this, if this country doesn't get a grip of what it means to be Protestant, of who the Protestant reformers unanimously identified as Antichrist, then this country is going to become a Roman Catholic superstate. And the persecutions that we're now reading about here in England are going to take place without restraint. This country is headed for a bloodbath unparalleled, in the, possibly in the history of the world. And few whose blood is shed will even know who shed it. Quoting further, it says, The Pope never interferes with temporal affairs, constantly declares his followers, But here he stood before the whole nation of England in the person of his legate who spoke by his command and directed such legislation by Parliament as should concentrate all dominion in his hands. Not interfere with temporal affairs when he causes his legate to tell the people of England that they ought to become his slaves because his predecessor, Pope Adrian IV, had given Ireland to them and made Irish people their slaves? not interfere with temporal affairs when he points out the very facts and and statutes which are to be abrogated and repealed, not interfere with the temporal affairs when this great legate at one of the most critical points in English history tells the king, queen, and parliament that the power of the pope over the nation comes directly from God and that it is therefore, quote, imperial and ecclesiastical, in other words, church and state, and that it will be for the welfare of their souls and bodies that they should obey him. You dare say that the Pope doesn't interfere in temporal affairs? You see, hypocrisy knows no bounds in Romanism, and it shows no mercy to any dissenting voice. R.W. Thompson continues, he says, The legate was obeyed. The Pope had his own way. The obnoxious statutes were all repealed. The people were subdued by threats, persecution, and bloodshed, and Philip and Mary did all they could to carry out the infernal league between Charles V and the Pope. No matter whatever, no what, uh, no matter what else a man did, if he acknowledged the supremacy of the Pope, he was rewarded by royal and papal favor. No matter how faithful a Protestant was to all the obligations of citizenship, his religion was criminal enough to subject him to torture and death. Philip had brought with him from Spain the passion for torture, which the Inquisition had incited there, and the war of extermination was carried on with a thirst for blood such as fills alike the mind and the untutored savage and an intolerant pope. John Rogers and other martyrs were burned to ashes for the crime of denying the doctrine 
of transubstantiation and calling the Church of Rome the Church of Antichrist. When Bishop Hooper was carried to the stake, the process of burning was so slow, so tardy, that he died by slow degrees of torture, knocking his breast with his hands until one of his arms fell off, and then with the other till it stuck fast to the, to the hot iron. Latimer and Ridley had to be burned to gratify the vengeance of that papistical monster, that papist monster, Gar uh, Gardner, the Bishop of Winchester and Lord Chancellor of England. And so horrible were the innumerable cruelties practiced upon the multitude of papal victims that the blood almost curdles as we read at its distance of time, the narrative of them. As they stand without example in all history, except in the papal, ex excuse me, except in the pagan persecutions of early Christians and the Romish persecutions of the valley of the, uh, in the valleys of the Valdois, so there is nothing to save them from universal execration. All that even Lingard can say of them is that, quote, it was the lot of Mary to live in an age of religious intolerance when to punish the, profess the professors of erroneous doctrine was inculcated as a duty no less by those who rejected than by those who asserted the papal authority, unquote. Overlooking the important facts that up till the reign of Mary, there had been no persecution in England in behalf of Protestantism. That Henry VIII had persecuted both Papists and Protestants and was never a Protestant in religious faith, and that no single drop of Roman Catholic blood had been shed during the Protestant reign of Edward VI. But we've already learned that the persecutions of Protestantism in England did not begin with either Mary or Henry VIII. The examples heretofore enumerated show that it was learned by both of them, not alone from some of their Roman Catholic predecessors, but from the direct teachings of the faith of the Roman Catholic Church, which were supported by the false decretals and the additions made to them from time to time after the adoption of the original forgeries. But these forgeries merely conferred the power to persecute when necessary for the Church. The decree of the Fourth Lateran Council made it a duty of fixed and, and also fixed a penalty for its non-performance. This was manifestly the interpretation given to it by Pope Gregory IX in his subsequent attempt to execute this canon with all the terrible vengeance it invited. With a view to the extortion of money, he exacted in England a tenth part of all the movable goods of the kingdom, because the Emperor Frederick hindered the persecution of the Albigenses, and for other reasons. He excommunicated him and released all his subjects from their allegiance, which proves incontestably that the duty to persecute, the duty to persecute and exterminate heretics was not only a part of the Roman Catholic canon law, but of the doctrinal faith of the Roman Catholic Church. To give the utmost possible strength to the injunction, this same Pope, Gregory the Ninth, in, announced infallibly, of course, the impious doctrine that, quote, Christians should not regard the sanctity of an oath toward him who is the enemy of God and who tramples under feet the decrees of the Roman Catholic Church, unquote. Claiming as he did in the most unequivocal manner the right to govern the world, temporally and spiritually, by virtue of power derived from God, it is not to be doubted that when he set the code of canon laws into England during the reign of Henry the, 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 the III, the decree of the Lateran Council constituted a part of it and that interpreted by the persecutions of the Albigenses, it was designed to place the duty of exterminating heretics, that is, the duty of exterminating Protestants, no, 
No, it's the duty of extirpating all but Roman Catholics upon the ground that he, that he who did so would thereby serve God and win his way to heaven. That's right. If you're a loyal Roman Catholic, you want a free pass to heaven, you kill a non-Catholic, especially one who speaks out against the Roman Catholic Church. Whether he be a Protestant, a Muslim, or a Buddhist, or an atheist. Rome even persecutes her own, as history so copiously demonstrates. This is that which is prophesied in the Scriptures. It is not Christ, nor the vicar of Christ, nor anything to do with Christ, but Christ's antithesis. The biblical and historical antichrist. It considers itself a benefit of doing God's service when it kills someone who will not bend his knee to the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical and historical Antichrist of Rome. And if you're still looking to the future for the Antichrist, or if you're looking to the distant past in Nero as the Antichrist, you have missed it. Because history reveals without equivocation who the real biblical and historical Antichrist is. It is the succession of popes in the Roman Catholic Church. That church, which thinks itself a queen and who is no widow and who will see no sorrow, will see the two-edged sword of Christ when he returns. Don't be a part of that slaughter. Get out of the ecumenical movement. Tomorrow on Inquisition Update. Visit CrossTheBorder.org C-R-O-S-S CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book the rapture will be canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven year tribulation deception true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book the rapture will be canceled. Visit crossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crossTheBorder.org.